Oh, I'd like to welcome back to the channel the people's historian, the Cat Williams of physical culture, Jamie Lewis. How are you doing, Jamie? Hey, what's up? I was re just reading Adam K's comment. The guy at the bottom of the uh, is a spitting. Who's the guy at the bottom? I think in the thumbnail, there's like all the prisoners oh. surrounding Arnold kissing the girl. Oh, 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 oh word, word. <laughs> yeah, it's actually oh, funny about that that prison scene because that was in uh, Terminal Island in California. Um, Arnold was visiting a certain somebody that will go unnamed at the moment. But oh, wait, um, wait, wait, can I guess? Can I guess? Was it Paul Grant? I, I won't comment, but um, okay. Yeah, was it he, he's re recently released a lot more footage uh, of that scene, and it's actually quite interesting. You see more of the guys in the background, like Franco, and that as well. So, oh, yeah. nice, yeah, nice. So, uh, yeah, we're going to talk jail shit today. Uh, I th when you were originally talking about that, I th I thought you were talking about the. Uh, there's a photo I I've seen of Bill Grant in like a prison outfit. And I thought he had been in jail, but it was just a, a photo for a movie or something like that. Yeah. Cause what kind of got me thinking about this topic is I've been reading a good book recently called masters of the air. And it's about the world war two bombing campaign, you know, with the allies on the Germans. And anyway, You're like still into world, world war two. Oh my God. I'd rather am, learn about, uh, oh, I'd rather learn about anything else, but go ahead. They've got a mini series now that ties in with it. So I always like to kind of read the book first, but they were saying that the uh, down them and, we're in the German prison of war camps and they were getting fed between 1500 and 1900 calories a day. But interestingly enough, they still, as the book was saying, they created these little colleges where the POWs were basically teaching the courses. And they said they offered courses in chemistry, mathematics, physics, physics, history, and even bodybuilding and looked into a little bit more. And they had made all this exercise equipment and everything. I thought even on 15 to 1900 calories in a World War II prisoner of war camp, not knowing whether tomorrow is going to come, these guys were still getting after it. So I think what is everybody else's fucking excuse, you know? <laughs> well, the thing is in jail. And uh, so there's no magic, like there's no magic to jail or, or like a, how people get buff in jail. It's literally boredom. You're fucking bored. And that's what I keep trying to say with, uh, with all these 19th century guys is like, if you didn't have this phone in your hand and you didn't have a TV that had more than six channels, like what, what you and I grew up with, like you are going outside and fucking exercising. Cause there's nothing else to fucking do. Like at some point you played enough fucking board games. You can't listen to the radio. Or, like you, like there's only so many things you could fucking do. So you're going to do pushups cause there's nothing else to do. And with jail, it's like, you just keep peeling back. Like, so now all you have is like books and fucking pushups. So you're going to do books and pushups. You're going to read every book you can read and do every pushup you can do. It's literally all there is to do and play chess. But I sort of think about the motivations of people outside prison. You know, they've got all the resources out there, fingertips. And in, in jail, and I'm assuming like in regular jail these days, the resources are scarce. You know, like you've got limited energy. You've got uh, limited equipment. You've got limited food. You know, in the case of the POWs, 1,500 calories. The last thing I'd be wanting to do is bodybuild. So, uh, See, again, you're wrong. Uh, so <laughs> there is a uh, – the first month, at least I, I was in a kind of bougie jail, but the first month – is like a prison camp. So it's uh, it's like the indoc takes a month in this one jail. And so uh, they give you three very small meals a day and you're on basically 1500 calories and you never go outside. And you're just basically in this big room with individual rooms of like cells. It's, it's like one big jail cell that's like two or three stories high. And then little bunks in each one of them with tons of guys and like bunk beds. And so all there is to do is like fucking bullshit with each other, play cards and do push-ups. Like it doesn't matter that you're starving. You're like, well, fuck, I'm going to get ripped. Like uh, the first time I went into jail, I had been drinking like a fucking psychopath for like six months. So I was going to the gym, like, I don't know, once, once a week or twice a week. I was still going to the gym once or twice a week, but uh, I was like drinking a handle of fucking vodka a day. So when I got to jail, I was pretty out of shape and I was fucking DTing and doing pushups because otherwise all you do is stare at the clock thinking, when the fuck am I going to get another goddamn bologna sandwich? And I had never fucking eaten bologna before jail. So that was, that was exciting. I started looking forward to bologna because you're like meat. It's going to do a body good. I read an interesting quote that you um, put on your website 
basically speaking about your prison experience when you came out and you said this one. I'd like to clarify. I was never in prison. Prison is big boy jail. That's like when you're in, when you've committed a serious crime, I was in jail for two DUIs. So let's just uh, be very it, clear. It's all the same it, thing down here. I think okay. we call it prison uh, oh. jail. So yeah, it's synonymous. Yeah. A county, it's, so it's like county, county is, or a city is jail and then a state or federal is prison. So I yeah, see. it's still 1500 big. calories. So it still sounds yeah. pretty shitty. By the time you say oh, yeah. it, you <laughs> it sucked. You said in your quote that you learned that you could do a hell of a lot with very, very little. And you said we all can. And that kind of oh, struck yeah. me quite high because I thought that's a, that's a good way to put it. So what did well, the scale so teach you about? I was going to say, what did the experience teach you about life lifting in yourself? Well, uh, first, uh, like uh, going to the prison camp thing, like uh, with working out in prison camps and stuff like that. So um, so you you get like every at every meal, you know, you're going to get certain food stuffs. And like I wouldn't know what it, what they were getting in the uh, well, I know in King Rat, they were getting one egg a week. And the rest of the time, it was just like a cup of rice every day. And um, so like with that, you don't have a lot of room for barter, but I'm, there were still like people catching mice and fucking making mice burgers or some shit. So there was some way for people to barter for extra protein. And so there was definitely that going on. I would always trade shit for milks and uh, eggs really fuck up my stomach. So I would always trade away my eggs for milks. Uh, like I hate oatmeal, but I was eating oatmeal in there because it had more protein than grits. Like, so there are things that you do to like game it and then. Um, so that was one thing I learned was bartering because in the West, you don't, we don't fucking barter at all. I've always hated bartering, but it's a necessary thing you have to do in jail. And, uh, so that was a very valuable thing. Uh, in, in jail, do guys train every day, bro in jail guys train all day, every day. And when I say all day, I mean, so lights are on at like six or whatever you, you eat pretty much immediately. And then everybody starts working out basically immediately. Like if you're going to be working out, you're already walking the block or doing pushups or doing pull-ups, like hanging off the stairs or whatever, doing squats. There were burpee guys that went fucking crazy. They, there were these guys who would like come in like a 110 pound crackhead and they would do nothing but hours of fucking burpees and then they would leave jail looking like superman it was fucking craziness but um we only would get to lift like um for an hour three times a week if you were in one part of the jail um so we would train all day getting ready for our hour at the gym and then just be chugging coffee for 45 minutes, like ready to go in and like lift as many weights as we possibly could in that hour. So like you never stop moving in the gym while you're in there. You're just lifting, 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 loading, unloading, lifting, lifting, lifting. Nobody's ever standing around. You're talking while you're lifting, but you never stop. Uh, do prisoners have access to special sauce? I in... I, maybe, I mean, back in the eighties, you could get anything in jail and I'm sure in some jails you can get anything in jail, but I was in a bougie ass fucking Montgomery County jail where they held Bill Cosby before he went to big boy prison. Like we had tablets before anybody else. So like there was no, we, and uh, no, uh, like at least not where I was. No, uh, like you're, you're trying to get as much milk as you can. I took a job on commissary because, uh, we could drink all the, we had access to a refrigerator that had milk in it. So you could drink milk all day long. And I fucking hate milk, but it's protein. And we had kettlebells like mixed in with all this shit. It was like hidden. So we could go and get some fucking sets of curls in and then go chug some milk. So, yeah. <laughs> Is it true that in a lot of the jails in America that they've actually removed the weights and they don't yeah, have? Yeah. Yeah. Almost all of them. Yeah. Cause you've actually wrote like a four part series and I was flicking through that as well about some of the techniques and the things that the guys do that don't have access to weights. Um, you said, obviously they had like calisthenics, they do TRX style. And then these had like partner assisted weights. Um, mm -hmm. What were some of the other things? Can you recall from your article? Uh, you mentioned uh, something called laundry bag lunacy. Oh yeah. People loved, uh, so your, uh, your laundry, like you only have a, a couple of like actual items in jail. And one of them is a laundry bag and they were really fucking sturdy ass laundry bags. So people would fill them with as much shit as they possibly could. Like, jugs of stuff people would save water bottles and then fill up the water bottles and like so they would keep them under their bunk and they had to keep them hidden against the wall because you're not allowed to keep all that shit under your bunk and so they'd keep the like 40 pounds of water bottles under their beds and then pile them all into uh into laundry bags and they would 
attach them to like uh, broomsticks and curl that shit, stuff like that. It was such a pain in the ass. I never really got into that. But you can see videos of like uh, there are former NFL players who are in prison now and they all do those fucking stupid ass laundry bag shit. <laughs> Uh, one of the commenters asked, um, can you actually gain muscle on a, like starvation calories? Yeah. I, I mean, provided you're getting that, uh, like enough protein, you, you don't need tons of calories to gain muscle. A, a, I, a lot of us are carrying less muscle than we think we are because we're way too fucking fat. And uh, I'm still grappling with being 180, 185 pounds because I feel fucking tiny even though everybody tells me i uh, like i'm big as shit i'm like no but i feel very small and uh uh but like i when i turn to the side like i have pecs that stick out in front of like my i have no more belly there is no more rounded belly and like but getting away from that like i'm big rather than i'm muscular that is really where you need to be so it's uh it's you have to change your mindset back to the 70s it, like the before 1980s, John, where people were like lean, they looked hungry. They looked like an athlete looks hungry. You should not look well fed as an athlete. Uh, well, uh, it, because I think a lot of you are carrying less muscle than you think you are in order to uh, you're carrying a lot less muscle than you think you are. And because you're deluded by thinking, oh, well, I'm fat and I'm big, so I'm carrying more muscle. You're not. You're going to have to get smaller in order to look bigger. and uh, But you will at the end of it, and you can attest to this. You're a bodybuilder. You look bigger when you get lean, right? Absolutely, especially in photos. You know, if you, as long as you're not standing next to anybody, if you're standing by yourself, yeah, the illusion can be um, quite deceptive. Well, dude, you look at Physical 100, like a lot of those guys are around six foot and like 185 pounds, which is not big by any stretch of the imagination. I mean, it's, I, I've always made fun of Frank Zane for being that size, but like they are Frank Zane looking dudes and they look fucking great. Even next to huge dudes, they look great. Yeah, 100%. What is your actual goals now? Because you've moved obviously from the strength world more to kind of like, you know, you want to achieve an aesthetic look. What What is it? What's the long term goal for you now besides healing up your muscles and getting well as well. Uh, I want to, uh, I know it's going to sound silly, but I'm trying to get that high pec look that like they had in the fifties and the sixties, like that big, the big rib cage, tiny waist, high pec look. Uh, I would also like to do one more powerlifting meet. Once I've fixed everything, I'm going to do one more powerlifting meet and do my, uh, my old total, like without a belt or any other equipment and with actually perfect form and i mean with a smile on my face no histrionics maybe i'll even do a dance routine before every single attempt like that's where i want to be i want to are, demonstrate are actual record? strength no not even a new record i just want to redo my old record with the greatest most ridiculous ease anybody has ever lifted any weights yeah that's awesome man what a goal let's uh can't wait to see you get after that so like with right. none of the stomping around and all that crazy shit pounding my chest. No, just the way I lift now where I'm actually enjoying myself and it feels good. And like, I'm not forcing anything. It's just moving weights because I'm fucking strong. And that's what I would like to do. Just have be one power lifter ever to just show up at a meet and actually look fucking good while they lift. <laughs> yeah, that would be uh, a sight to say. Awesome. Um, I was actually looking because, you know, I was, the second we got part a ton of, of comments over here. Should we uh, should we hit some? Oh of these? yeah, sure. So thoughts on rest days. Steve Reeves and Leroy Colbert were adamant about only training three times a week, full body. What do you think of that? I think. Uh, well, that Colbert was more. Uh, Leroy Colbert did train more than that, and they weren't. So when you when they when you think that they're adamant about training three times a week, Steve Reeves was basically following what everybody else was following, like the York barbell programs. And so they had, they recommended you train to three to four times a week with heavy barbells. It wasn't like a, that wasn't all the training you did. You did like calisthenics. I mean, you always see these guys doing hand balancing. They were always on the beach with women throwing them up in the air and, and other guys and building human pyramids and shit like that. Playing beach, beach volleyball, having dip contests, having pull-up contests. Like that went on every fucking day of their lives. Cause these guys 
did not diet. They didn't train for meets. What they did was they had an in-season and an off-season. So in the winter, they only went to the gym a couple of times a week because it wasn't their life. And then uh, the uh, like, and they kind of toned it back because you couldn't be on the beach because it's fucking cold. But the second it was warm enough to be on the beach, they were outside all day long the entire day exercising because they didn't fucking work. They were all on the GI Bill and shit. So they did not work at all. They just stayed on the beach, fucked women, fucked other dudes and like, and lifted each other, lifted weights. And then, uh, so the three times a week thing, uh, we have fucked up entirely back then they did. Uh, so it was like the base was a couple of sets of 10 of maybe seven or eight exercises, like a full body routine. And you actually did it as a, like, um, as a round rather than sets and reps. So you do like one set of 10 of each of these exercises all the way through taking as short pe rest periods as you could, then you would go back through. And once you had done that a couple of times, then you would specialize on whatever you wanted to. Some guys like training legs, some guys like training arms, some guys like training shoulders, some guys trained everything. Some guys just went and did more hand balancing, like Burt Goodrich, who was one of the first Mr. Americas. So, um, but they were still training all fucking day long. And it like literally nonstop. And when I say they didn't diet or anything like that, the pictures you see of Steve Reeves and Mr. America or whoever in Mr. America, that's what they looked like every fucking day of the week. Every day of the week for the entire summer, they looked like that. I mean, they looked a little better, a little worse, but that's what they looked like. So like we are so out of shape, so fat and so sad compared to these guys. That's why I'm trying to get back to this old this old school vibe. Like I feel good now. I ran into a dude that I've known for years who thought that I had forgotten him. But uh, he, uh, we didn't really like each other back in the day. But anyway, he, uh, he's been a longtime fan. And uh, like, I don't, um, oh, they, she, her name is Venta. She's uh, like Venta Black, the blackest, uh, the blackest black. Um, but cats obviously can't say Vs because uh, they don't have muscular lips. So it's Venta. Uh, but she only has one eye because she lost one when she was a baby. I, I love that cat. Uh, anyway, <laughs> so um, uh, now I've lost track of where I was. Uh, oh, so I want to be like that. I want to get back to that and I'm getting there. I like, I know you keep saying you, I, we want you to unveil it. I don't want to give you halfway there. I just want to be there and have everybody be like, oh, he wasn't fucking lying. Cause I have never once said I was going to do something and failed to do it. I don't do that. If I say that I am doing it, it's because I have been doing it for a very fucking long time and I'm this fucking close. So we're, we're almost there. The unveiling and will no, be soon. no doubt you'll get there, man. That's great. Great to hear. I love yeah. that just getting after it as well. Um, I was just thinking we can move on to our next uh, topic, but uh, this one's also related to prisoners. But uh, I read a quote oh, about. Oh, from uh, wait. We still have, we still have, we still have more questions. Uh, oh, we got. Uh, you don't necessarily need to be in a caloric sur a surplus to gain muscle. You just need one point six, and I, this is a very low number. 1.6 grams of protein per kg of body weight. It's so much lower than I ever recommended. And, but it's the science is very, very fucking clear. Like it's 1.6 kg, uh, 1.6 grams per kg. That's it. That's all you need. Any more does not help more. So stop overeating protein. It doesn't like, I mean, it will give you a greater thermic effect, but there's no fucking point. We're just murdering animals for no reason. Um, I, do be, oh, you don't need to be, you don't even need to count calories. Like this is what I've been talking about with all these old school guys. They didn't count calories and like, uh, they didn't, they really didn't diet hard. They didn't, there was no concept of dieting. There was barely even a concept of calories and protein and carbohydrates. I mean, that was all pretty new. They, this, this stuff was not on boxes in the grocery store. Like you didn't know how many calories were in something unless you like asked a scientist. So like, I mean, you didn't, you didn't have to ask a scientist, but the information was not readily available. You had to go to a library and look shit up. And like these guys were on meth out on the beach, throwing people in the air. They were not in the library. Um, so yeah, we've just been overthinking it. The supplement industry really fucked us up. Uh, and we're all very fat, which is <laughs> like oh, really a problem. Yeah, um, I remember even in the 90s and the early 2000s, we never had any of the calorie or the nutrition labels on anything. And we had to use like a little a book, a calorie counter book, if we wanted to mm -hmm. do any macro calculations. People are really spoiled these days because everything's available at the fingertips. But uh, we got one more question there about 
Thoughts on raw meats like Armand Tal Tani did. Armand Tani. Uh, Armand Tani was a he was a funny guy. Uh, he now he was dead on about one thing. So he was. Uh, do you know who Armand Tani was? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, cool. Uh, so, um, Vic Armand Tani had all the, um, Armand, yeah, Vic Tani had all the gyms that they started in California. Yeah. Yeah. And Armand Tani, his brother, I think he won Mr. America or something like that, but he was a, he was a nut. He trained crazy and he loved raw foods. Uh, he was real big in it, eating oysters and oysters are, I mean, if there's one thing that could make you superhuman, uh, that I will not consume. It's oysters. And they literally, it's the perfect fucking lifting food. It's what all the old school guys eat. And I have started hearing like little tales here and there of old school guys, like whispering, like oysters, that's what you got to eat. Like it's not steroids, it's oysters. And it's like, God damn, like it's really, but I'm not eating sea snot. So, uh, <laughs> uh, what would you call fat and what's a good body fat to stay at? Uh, so I've never been a fan of testing body fat because if you test your body fat with four different measures, you're going to get four wildly different answers. And that fucking drives me crazy. So I don't give a shit about that. I like, it's a matter of like, so we all have 36, 38 inch waists. Like it's, they're crazy, crazy big waists. These bodybuilders back in the day had like 32 inch waist. And I'm not talking about the pant size. Your pant size is not indicative of your waist size. Your pant size is uh, there's a thing called vanity sizing that they started in uh, women's clothing and brought into men's clothing. So the 32s that you're wearing now were like 36s back in, or 38s back in the 80s. Like it's, they've done the same thing with women's clothes and men's clothes. And uh, yeah, so we're all just fat as fuck and we got to pull it together. I mean, our pants are stretchy now, probably because we're fat more so than because we're... Uh, because science advanced and wanted us to be more comfortable. Although I do love stretchy pants. <laughs> and just on that point about um, Steve Reeves training only three times a week, I was reading into his wartime record where he was training in the army and when he was based in uh, the Philippines and his fellow soldiers were saying that guy was an exercise nut. He was training literally all the time. So mm -hmm. again, you know, even in the hardest of conditions, Steve Reeves is still getting after it. Something tells me that he wouldn't have cut it back to three days a week just because he was back in good old US of A. So, oh, um, dude, you there's pictures of uh Bert Elliott who was an early uh bodybuilder, strong man, and he won the Iron Man, uh, the first Iron Man competition, which was a bodybuilding powerlifting meet that they had in California for a long time. Uh, there's pictures of him like lifting rocks over his head and shit, like on Iwo Jima and shit. He's like in the middle of a fucking war zone, picking up boulders and Chuck Sipes did the same shit. So like, yeah, every, uh, like I know when, when I used to post my workouts on, uh, uh, on like the net and shit like that, people would just say, no, you, you didn't do that. You couldn't do that. Nobody could do that. And I'd be like, yeah, I did a thousand pull-ups yesterday. No, you couldn't. Nobody could do that. I know when I say I did a thousand pull-ups yesterday, I did a thousand pull-ups and I'm not sore today because I do them that much. Like I haven't been doing pull-ups that much recently, but like, it's just a matter of getting good at these things and people are fucking lazy. Like if yeah. you want to be good at something, you have to do it. I'm reading also a book about Jack LaLanne at the moment. He used to do a thousand pull-ups on the regular as well. And that was well observed and documented. So you know, these we things give are... Jack LaLanne no credit because he wore that stupid jumpsuit and looked like an asshole. And it, the music he played was terrible on TV. But that guy was a fucking beast. He made Absolutely. Arnold puke in a workout. When Arnold was in his heyday of like rhabdo inducing workouts, Jack LaLanne made him throw up and quit a workout. Like that dude. Fu and he looked fucking amazing when he was a bodybuilder. Yeah. We just Absolutely. don't. He just gets forgotten about, which is tragic. No he, was he was one of the first great... influencers. He invented a whole lot of equipment that he didn't even patent. So, yeah, and he was really kind of like one of those forgotten characters of history. He had the first workout show on TV. I mean, it, it was fucking, it, it was horrible well. to watch. But, like, that. Yeah. and for anybody who has never seen it, it, there's literally an organ player going, dun, da, dun, da, dun, da, da, as he's doing, like, these fucking goofy-ass <laughs> exercises but still like he got housewives to exercise in the 50s moving along anyway we have this uh, have you ever heard of that guy he was in most of all the bodybuilding and strength documentaries he was always in the magazines his name was chuck yourselves he was this professor of health and human development and he was like the steroid okay. expert as well 
But um, he had this quote, and he was saying that few sports are intertwined with criminality as bodybuilding. He says, <laughs> you almost never see types of extreme behavior from any other athletes. I think this is back in 95 he was talking. Of course, it's pretty common now. He says, well, yes, football players, <laughs> until, football yeah. players, football players <laughs> get into fights, but they don't kill people. Well, he now says, they do. <laughs> yeah. But he said, like, is, is it the drugs or is it the bizarre subculture in which bodybuilders are immersed? And we're going to talk a little bit about the famous ex-cons or the current cons uh, in bodybuilding history. Uh, so do you have any good names to kick us off with? Uh, well, I mean, obviously there's Tukey. Tukey. Let's start with Tukey, the fa- co-founder of the Crips, Tukey Williams. Uh, Tukey oh, Williams, you got yeah. him all already. Dude had, what, 21, 22-inch arms. He, uh, and also, uh, this is a fun thing that I have not gotten to really – impart to people yet but if you've seen the old movie the warriors uh from the 70s gangs in the 70s were actually like that wearing colors like that except it was way better they were into fucking karate all of them because they used karate on the cops they used karate on each other and tukey was a big karate guy so he actually got his ass whipped by um uh the guy merriman uh steve merriman who uh went on to become like a super fucking karate champ but like they squared off at like on a dance floor in a because karate and break dancing and gangs and rap all happened together it like gangs were they had different like divisions in them they had like battling divisions and those guys did karate and then they had the the like social groups that did parties and that's how rap and break dancing started and so like these guys were taking the karate that they were using to fuck up cops with and fuck up other gang members with and then using it on the dance floor to invent new break dancing moves and while their friends are fucking rapping and so Tukey was involved in all of that and so was Craig Munson which is so fucking fun and I'm going to be telling that story at some point Craig Munson hey, baby, uh, there, goes, there you go another picture of Craig Munson there he was a beast, wasn't he? Jesus, like, look at yeah. him. That's like, that's like today's caliber size bodybuilders. You know, it's like Ronnie Coleman look. Danny Trejo was his training partner. Like, he, he didn't, didn't train with huge guys. He trained with Danny Trejo, this little guy Joe Pitt, who was the unofficial like mayor of Muscle Beach, uh, Candy Cazentis, who was a tiny little natty but a white girl bodybuilder, and like they all they were called the Bench Hogs, and they lifted at Muscle Beach together. There's a cool little video of them together. Yeah, oh, and there yeah. was one other guy, uh, the guy who in- introduced Suge Knight to Death Row Records also was a bench press world record holder and was in that crew too. Uh, Crockett, oh, okay. Wes Crockett. Right. Do you remember this guy? Don Howarth. Don Howarth. Yeah, I, dude, I, that is my idea. Like if you, when you said, what is your goal? That's my goal. Right. Cause he looked you like that at did? my age. He looked like that in his sixties. Like that is my goal right there. I want to be that look. Do you remember and why I know he that's was a, in jail? What's that? Do you remember why he was in jail? Uh, drug smuggling? Selling weed. Oh, okay. Nice. Uh, you know what? Here we go. I'm blazed already because we got up at four. It's It was a stressful morning. So Don fucking Howarth. All right. I'm going to blaze for him today. <laughs> Any other big names that you can think of that were prisoners? Maybe I'll talk about this guy because he was like a, a hometown hero where I used to live. Uh, his Ooh, name's he Nathan Jones. Uh, yeah, his name's Nathan Jones. He was the Colossus of Bogo Road because Bogo Road was the name of the prison. And he okay. was in there at 18 years of age. I think he got sent there for between 7 or 12 years for um, armed robbery. Oh, but shit. Um, I, I was talking to a prison guard I used to live, and he said that he was at the jail that Nathan was. And Nathan not only ripped his cell door off, he bent the bars of his prison, like so. He fully grabbed them and, and ripped them apart. And they reckon that when this guy trained, he would literally make the whole prison shake with just the ruckus and throwing the dumbbells and everything else. But that even is, him, so he was a, he, I think he was an amateur strongman champ too. Yeah, yeah, he's done quite a few things. He's been in like the recent recent Mad Max film. He's done like a few roles, yeah. Role. But yeah, he's a bit of a giant, so. Quite impressive that yeah. he was a prisoner as well. <laughs> I I love that dude's physique. He looks fucking great. So yeah. Uh, do you think grip width makes a real difference in one's physique? 
Uh, oh, and so uh, Jake had two great questions, and I'm just going to hit them real quick because I, I don't yeah, want to make on. a get them lost in there. Uh, so he said, I heard you mention once about dumbbell pullovers. What do you think about them? What do you work them for? Rib cage expansion, lats, chest. Uh, can it replace them with cable or Nautilus pullover or stay with dumbbell? That's an awesome question. I appreciate you asking it. Uh, I don't do dumbbell pullovers. I do barbell pullovers. Uh, the reason is the old, old school guys did barbell pullovers. And I've noticed that there is a very different effect on the way it stretches your triceps and your shoulders as opposed to the dumbbell. It, it, so you get a, it's a way more aggressive stretch. And that is the point of the pullover. Uh, people in the 60s started to get carried away with like trying to do the most weight in a pullover. I think they were inspired by Steve Stanko because Steve Stanko used to be able to do a bar barbell pullover and press from the floor uh, with 300. And he would just do like two of them and he'd be like, chest is over with and move on with his life. And um, but so I've started doing pullover and press. That's basically the only chest exercise I do other than incline flies right now. Um, and because I'm trying to develop both the separation in my pecs and my lats and my rear delts, like all of the separation that you see in those areas that is on the old school bodybuilders you don't see on guys now, all in the armpits, it's from these pullovers. I swear on my life. It's from pullovers and doing arm extensions and overhead shit. Uh, I also do front raises now for that very reason, barbell front raises, and I'll hold the, the barbell down here and flex it down. So I'm flexing my pecs, my shoulders, my triceps, my and like trying to push my biceps out. It'll initially make your biceps look fat and flabby and gross. Just fucking ignore it, wear a long sleeve shirt and start forcing your muscles into the positions where they're supposed to be. You will look so much leaner. Like, so I keep saying everybody's fat. You will look leaner just from getting your muscles in the proper positions by stretching them into that position and flexing them into that position and massaging them, all of which was a very important part of exercise back in the day, stretching, flexing, and massage. Um, but that is the reason why I do them. It's for shoulder health, lat health, uh, separation, definition, and because uh, and rib expansion, and because if Steve Stango could do a pullover and press with three hundred uh, back in nineteen forty, and when you if you put your refrigerator inside your house, it would fucking kill you with the fumes that it would release. Like if he could live in that kind of a situation and build that, I can fucking do it too. So that's uh, <laughs> that's where I'm going with that. Uh, and then he had uh, wide grip pull ups. We have a thousand and one questions now about the pullover coming in. <laughs> uh, so straight arm, uh, when I'm doing them on a bench, I do them with, uh, with bent arm. So if I'm going like from the bench to the floor and, and I really, here's my fucking tip for everybody. And I'm actually going to put this in the, the workout protocol. I'm doing a condensed thing of huge natty arms. So people don't have to read 60 pages. Uh, the exercise that I love now is a pullover from the floor. So I'm only using like between 45 and 115 pounds. I have not gone over 115 pounds and I don't generally go that heavy. I'm usually uh, at 65. Uh, yeah, 65. So uh, I do a pullover to my chest from the floor on a regular bench, press it, take it down to the, to the forehead for a skull crusher, back to a full extension, back down to the chest, back down to the floor. And that has changed the way bench pressing feels for me entirely. Like bench pressing used to be a matter of kind of wiggling through positions that my body didn't want to go to try to straighten my arms. And I don't have any of that weird, like trying to jam my shoulder forward to get a lockout or shit like that. It really, oh, Bill McArdle did have great shape and his triceps were fucking outrageous. Uh, but super wide grip pull-ups do them because we all have locked uh, scapula from doing those stupid fucking arched bench presses. And it's going to feel like it's literally going to feel like your soul is being torn out of your body when you start pulling your shoulder blade off of your lats and uh, and your rib cage. I mean, it genuinely, it'll make you want to throw up. So just hang from the fucking bar. But we all need to be doing these uh, these stretches. Uh, also, straight arm pull downs are a fucking great thing to do, but I don't recommend uh, pullovers with cables or the Nautilus machine because you're you're not getting that stretch. That's where you're like, oh well, I'm trying to optimize the mark. Of brush. Shut the fuck up. We're not trying to optimize. We're trying to make this. You're trying to make it so that 
anytime you grab any, this is what I'm trying to do. Anytime I grab any weight of any kind, a 60 pound weight, if I grab it and I need to point to somewhere and be like, go over there and grab that fucking dumbbell for me. I don't have, to, I don't care that I got a 60 pound dumbbell in my hand and I can reach back and scratch my fucking back with it in my hand as well. Like I'm doing shit like that because I hate being exposed for weird weaknesses like oh well i just can't fucking move my arm in that way or i can't do a clean because my fucking wrists won't bend like that those excuses have driven me crazy my whole life and i'm not going to live with them anymore plus the more i get rid of those things the less pain i'm in every day like the guy who i met ran into the other day he was like so what hurts on you fucking nothing i mean uh like occasionally this hand will hurt because this hand's still fucked up from breaking my wrist but uh, it's because my knuckles massively swollen. So it's just another knot I have to get out of my body. Uh, Speaking when of is... hurt. Yeah. Brutal oh, Fox. brutal brutal Fox. He had a bad John for prison. That was right up there with uh, with Manohar H being in a, <laughs> like an Indian prison in the 1950s. Brutal Tell us Fox the Gary in... Stratton remark. What's that? Tell us the Gary Stratton remark about oh, Bertel. Yeah. <laughs> so Bertel killed his uh, his girlfriend and her mom. Uh, and Gary Stratton, who is my pick for the best uncrowned Mr. Olympia. That guy has a phenomenal physique. Uh, he, <laughs> maybe on coke, said that Bertel Fox's uh, mur double murder was accidental. Uh, they were fighting for a gun and uh, and he accidentally killed them both. With so I'm I don't know I don't know how that works. So like, how do you accidentally bang bang? Uh, is that a thing? <laughs> Apparently so. According Whoopsie to Gary, Daisy. I guess, uh, <laughs> but he was in a fucking together. Caribbean prison on death row for a long time. Caribbean yeah. prisons are open to the elements. Like that is, I don't. Well, you've never been to the Caribbean, but when I say open to the elements, I mean when you're driving by a Caribbean prison, you can see through the prison. Cause they just like every other brick is there. Uh, so like it lets wind through and shit. So you're getting rained on in prison. You're getting like whatever animals wants to run over you in prison. Like, and he was in there for 30 years or whatever. So that was a, that was a bad John. <laughs> that was a bad John. Did you ever hear about this guy here? Gordon Kimbra? Similar uh, sort of crime. I have never heard of him. Yeah, he killed his girlfriend as well, and I think he got 35 years. I don't really know a lot about him, but I did remember him being in the magazines a little bit. But, yeah, he so wasn't he, uh, famous. He well. is a great example of what I'm talking about with the pecs. So uh, you can see he has no definition between his pecs and his front delts. And you'll see a lot of body – like Jim Stepani, for instance. If you, if you look up a picture of Jim Stepani, he always has his – shoulders pulled way back and pro wrestlers do it now too they pull their shoulders way back because their fucking pecs look like shit hanging down it looks like they have gyno or they have really fat pecs it's not it's just that we have like a muscle that's like budged up in our armpits and it's you have to use these pullovers to get them out um oh and uh straight arm pullovers do them laying on the floor uh, you can do them both bouncing, and, like a rebounding pullover and not rebounding. Uh, but I, I like them very strict with a straight arm. And it's really, really, really good to do them with a straight arm because a lot of us struggle to lock our arms out if we can. And that pain that you experience when you're trying to lock out should not occur. So this is a great exercise for trying to get your arms into the positions they need to be. But then going back to the prisoners. Can you tell me two two Mr. Olympia title winners who have been to prison before? Dorian Yates. Yes. Winners. Uh, I know Harold Poole. Well, no, Harold Poole went to jail, but he wasn't a winner. Uh, winner, winner. <laughs> what else did Harold go to jail for? He, he was into, involved in a lot of like uh, like petty crime shit. Oh, wait, no. Dennis Tenorino wasn't... Uh, he didn't win Olympia. I don't know. Who's the other one? Well, I'm kind of playing this one on technicality, but the other one was Arnold because remember when he went AWOL in the army and they put him in solitary confinement for a couple of weeks or something for skipping out and going to the junior Mr. Europe? Uh, yes. Uh, and then, and then this is a, a little known thing as well. Yeah, he wasn't. That's why he didn't go back. Because So he made that thing like, oh, no, I'm too much of a bodybuilder to go back for my dad's funeral. No, he couldn't go back to his dad's funeral because he would have been arrested for going into Austria. Yeah, well, there was, a, there was a rumor that he had to leave Germany because of that, because he was 
kind of wanted by the police. And but then there was an incident with Paul Graham where they were in, both involved in a car theft ring, and Arnold smashed one of the Mustangs up, and the gear stick went through his leg. So he had to call um, Bill Williams, I think, to come and help him out and get him to the emergency room very quickly. <laughs> Arnold, would have been, hilarious. Arnold, Arnold and Paul Graham were both arrested. However, Paul Graham took the fall and ended up going to prison for several years while Arnold got Scott, went out scot-free because he, he, of course, would have been deported and that would have been the end of Arnold. So that's why Paul Graham was always in Arnold's good books kind of forever after that. He was one of the best men at Arnold's wedding. But it was very fortunate that Paul Graham took the rap for him. So things could have ended up very different for old Arnold. Yeah, well, you know what? Paul Grant was a – he was a good-looking guy. Like, he really – he had a great physique and, yeah. Strong man, so, crocodile wrestler. Oh, was he? Look at uh, – yeah. oh, that's right. He was a – he was an Australian. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, here, I didn't even – Here's another honorary guy. Oh, can, can we just, just real quick uh, – yeah, yeah. the Iron History, Bill Pearl was on 30 megs of bull drugs. Let's be clear. Uh, he was on – wasn't he on methyl test? Uh, he was the one that, or was uh, he on Nilovar? Arthur, Arthur Jones introduced a Nilovar, yeah. Oh, okay. Well, Nilovar is really mild. Like, I uh, anybody like that would be like saying that some kid who took fucking uh, what halo? Like one of those stupid halo over the counter halo things, or like the estrogen suppressants was because Nilovar wasn't even really a, an anabolic steroid. It was like a really strong anti estrogen, but then it like had estrogenic effects. It was a weird fucking drug, and it had tons of sides. So it was not. Bill was a little bit weird when it came to the whole drug scene as well, because you know he openly admitted he goes, "I put on thirty pounds when I took Nilovar." which didn't really kind of translate into the photographic evidence when you saw him. But then he also reckons also, that from it, then on, he, from then he, on, but he, he didn't, didn't gain 30. I, I, I said it in a video, like he didn't gain 30 pounds, but at any point, like he gained 30 pounds between his first Mr. Olympia or his first Mr. America appearance and his like win in 1971 or something like that. But this, this where was his 30 pounds? Yeah, otherwise? Yeah. Self-proclaimed. Yeah. But, um, you know, Bill also went on to sort of say that any of his wins after that little initial experiment with steroids, he was drug free the entire time, which is completely absurd because, you know, he was competing against guys like Reg Park and a few other guys, uh, Frank Zane, for example, and he was in better condition then. So he's, I don't know, I think they just bullshit a little bit sometimes. They took a lot of fucking drugs back then. So, I mean, it's very likely they don't even remember what the fuck they took. I mean, I don't. I don't I, do you remember what gray market like super droll bullshit you took 10 years ago? Cause I don't like, I couldn't give an accurate representation of what that was. I don't know. Like I took a handful of shit here and there. Like who knows what the fuck it did. It probably just killed my liver. <laughs> did this guy put an article on him as well. And uh, they ended up turning him into a movie. Did you? And he's they did. A they did. The ancient Olympian or ancient Olympians. They uh, it wasn't illegal to cheat in the in the Olympia. It was just illegal to get caught. So nobody gave they they expected you to do as much as you could to win. It was just like it was shameful to get caught. Charlie Bronson, probably the world's greatest self promoter. <laughs> Fifty years this year he's been in prison for. He was originally sentenced for only seven back in 1974. Seven years they gave him for attempted armed robbery, and because he's been such a Fucking maniac that the entire time beating up uh, prisoners. And he's had like a hundred attempted murders since then. It wasn't yeah, like yeah. he's in jail for no reason. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, apparently he's been spending 50 years of solitary confinement doing bodybuilding uh, weights. He's got a couple of training books out as well. So uh, we'll, we'll give him the honorary nod for that one. I think that's really a failure of uh, mental health services. I mean, the guy's clearly out of his fucking mind and he just, yeah. he really just needed hugs and uh, <laughs> like it, you know, everybody back then had lead poisoning. And although I guess a lot of the people in the American South have lead poisoning because NASCAR uses, used leaded gasoline until 2007. That was just crazy. Yeah. Can you think of but any other uh, criminals related to bodybuilding? 
Oh, there's tons of. I mean, there's Dennis Tanarino is probably my favorite to talk about because uh, I, do you know much about Dennis Tanarino? He was involved in that whole Muscle Beach crew. Yeah, yeah, he was um, connected to the mob. Um, he was reformed, born again Christian or something, and he became a preacher, and you know, took the usual redemption arc as they all do. Yeah, yeah, but he was like a straight. He was a natty bodybuilder who was a crack dealer. Like, make that make sense? I don't fucking understand that at all. But apparently, Scott Wilson competed in natural bodybuilding as well, which blows my mind because that guy's shoulders were unreal. But yeah, that absolutely. was a monster. There was also Dave Palumbo. He was uh, an ex-con as well. Um, Greg Valentino. Oh, that's not Dick surprising. Martinez. Greg Valentino also not surprising. Melvin Anthony, he was a, ex, a pretty professional kind of level bodybuilder as well. It's, it's, I think he's still in jail. Uh, there's Jim Bradford, uh, who, uh, or wait, not Jim Bradford, Jim Williams. Uh, he was a world, uh, he was a world record holding bench presser. He might have been the first person to bench press 600. He basically just committed crimes and would train in prison and then break records. That's so, right. <laughs> um, yeah, there was, there have been a, oh, yep. Of course. Probably the most famous duo. Probably the most idiotic of all of them as well because they, they basically painted themselves in the corner with their stupidity, didn't they? Really? Boy, they... Uh, Craig Titus is one of the most unpleasant people I've ever met. Like, uh, yeah, Greg <laughs> Doucette, talk. another very unpleasant criminal. Oh, yeah, I yes, think his yeah. was for smuggling steroids or something. But yeah, geez. I think he was a high school teacher and he was uh, selling steroids or doing something. Like oh that. my god, that sounds about right. He really is a scumbag. Of all the people that were like shunned at powerlifting meets, he was probably the most shunned. I didn't even know who he was, so I was just like, "Why is nobody around that guy?" And they were like, "Oh, he's a piece of shit." And I was like, "All right, cool." <laughs> Did you ever see the Sally McNeil documentary, bro? I was pen pals with Sally McNeil trying to get her fucking uh, her workouts while she was in jail. I wrote a whole series on her. I, yeah, I, uh, I, I didn't watch the documentary because my wife is really pissed that I uh, used our home address for writing her. Uh, so um, so we didn't watch it because she was like, I don't even want to hear that fucking bitch's name. I don't want her showing up at our house. <laughs> But her yeah, sister uh, actually read the articles Valentine's and Day. loved them. And uh, her sister messages me periodically on Instagram. So her sister fucking hates her. And she's down in Georgia now just being a fucking asshole, apparently. Uh, right. <laughs> so if we've got any other questions, guys, send them in. Any comments as well, we will answer them before the last couple of minutes of the show tonight. Thoughts on Frank Zane? Um, <laughs> well, your thoughts, Jamie? <laughs> I, I mean, he was a great physique competitor and, uh, he, you know, the first unofficial Mr. Physique Olympia. Um, I I personally don't – I've never liked Frank Zane. I've never liked his physique. I've never liked his vibe. I've never liked any of it. He, I don't like – all that feigned, like, feigned calm shit, I, the yoga – that yoga teacher mentality. I can't do it. It's, it's so disingenuous. So I, I don't know. It seems disingenuous at least maybe that's him. Yeah. The guy always kind of felt like he um, had a bit of a chip on his shoulder and he was always kind of down. Whereas like Anna was the complete opposite of that. Like uh, for example, Frank Zane was getting a lot of the pre footage of pumping iron being filled on him. He thought that he was going to be the focus. And then when he saw that Arnold was really the uh, recipient of the limelight, he pulled out and went and tra trained at Vince Gironda's because he said, well, why don't you just call this fucking film Pumping Arnold? I'm out of here. So they basically had to scrap all of Frank Zane's footage. That's why you only see him in tiny little bits of the, the film because he wouldn't sign the release. I, I just, when you look at the guys on, I mean, so there has always been, and I don't know if the people who are uh, like listening or watching this have, any experience in bodybuilding, but there's always been this thing, at least like back in the, in the eighties and nineties and probably the seventies, uh, but it was really bad in the nineties. You had to guess whether the judges wanted you to come in ripped to the fucking bone or big and full. And you're competing for that. And you have no fucking clue what they want until you get there. So you just are gambling on, I'm going to show up shredded or I'm going to show up big. And Zane always gambled on shredded 
and he kept like he he was given a couple of gifts i feel like but like then he was mad that he lost and it's like bro you are playing the wrong fucking game like you know what you're doing you know what they're looking for and if they want that then give it to them or shut the fuck up so yeah i think he's his physique kind of coincided with the thinners in late seventies because, you know, mm-hmm. he, was, he was a good looking guy and Weeda was putting him on the covers a lot of the time as well. So he really thought that this was, you know, his game to lose basically. But then of course, Arnold with his indomitable kind of personality, he could never, Frank knew that he could never compete against that, that those intangibles that Arnold had. Uh, because well, Frank there obviously. Were, but there was also Draper too, that like there were so many guys who could just walk in and, beat Zane just for being like slightly personable and having big biceps. Like that was the era. Like be a cool, chill bro. Sur- like look like you fucking surf and like be cool to be around and you'll win. You know, yeah. that Arnold and Franco banging everybody's fucking girlfriends, but they still managed to get fucking Mr. Olympia. And you know, then Menser ends up fucking crying in a fucking cafe in his night, like in the nineties about the fact that he and Ray can't get laid in LA. Do you remember, do you remember Tom Minicello? He owns city gym in uh, New York. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Do you heard yeah. of him? I'm reading yeah. a book of his. It was kind of, it's an older book. It was very hard to get hold of and very expensive. He's a really important guy in uh, East yeah, Coast bodybuilding He's very history. well connected. So he really knew all the stories and all the TMZ gossip at the time. So I'm reading this book as well. I've got so many fucking books on the go at the moment. It's ridiculous. But um, he has put everybody under pseudonyms. But if you know the scene, you know who he's talking about. He's basically insinuated that Arnold did tons of gay for pay. Arnold sucked dick to get ahead. Literally sucked dick. Uh, him and Frank Zane had kind of like a... Um, a love-hate relationship that was literal as in love. Uh, and Franco used to get wildly jealous. And also that Frank uh, Arnold was also at times banging Charles Gaines, who made Pumping Iron, and was caught in bed with him. And this is from Milicello's pen. So this is a very kind of juicy book if you're into gossip. Well, you're friends with the, with the guy who made Dream Big. And Dream Big had an outtake from Pumping Iron where Arnold is talking about how he fucked a guy the night before and gave him the best night of his life. And he was there for coaching. And he was like, I gave him the best night of his life. And um, like, he was just very open about it. And that's just what went on back then. I don't like, uh, like, uh, yeah, I guess. I mean, I don't want to scandalize the fact that like, but everybody was bisexual. Like they were doing amphetamines you're not straight on amphetamine you're not straight on coke like it's just it's like it's not even a thing but they partied in a house where they were like they intentionally undressed in a room with two-sided mirrors so like they knew what was going on they knew the score i i i think that that's probably true i i mean so minicello is the guy who put everybody on to rasa von werder who uh who was the girlfriend of both Arnold and Franco. Uh, Arnold stole her from Franco, but she was, her name was Kelly Everts. She was the first female bodybuilder and like of the modern era. And when Minicello was asked, like uh, he was asked by, I think Charles Gaines, uh, cause they were doing a, some kind of like Vogue shoot or something like that. And he was like, yeah, so who's a female bodybuilder? And Tom Minichello was like, there's no such fucking thing as a female bodybuilder. And then he was like, well, if there is one, it's Kelly Everts. And, um, and so that's she was the first one in in bodybuilding lore and she, in magazines and stuff like that. She went on every talk show promoting bodybuilding and she was a fucking stripper. So she was a stripper bodybuilder. And then she started her own cult, uh, uh, like a, a misandric cult where she was using femdom wrestling videos to fund it. And so that they could like further uh, the, the matriarchy, which I find amazing. But like she's been totally written out of the history of bodybuilding, even though she's an essential part of it. And a girlfriend of Arnold and Franco, who I he, he she was being traded back and forth. And there's a lot of pictures of her sitting in a chair with both of them. So uh, again, it seems like what Tom Minicello said was most likely true. Yeah, I know. It's a very incestuous kind of world bodybuilding, isn't it? Uh, apart from, like I said, the drugs, the blur that the 70s must have been for most of these guys. Like like we said with Bill Pell, he probably couldn't remember what drugs he took. Arnold and Franco probably couldn't remember which girls they fucked. The whole thing was just uh, left up for those that were observing it and writing it down, I guess. 
uh, yo, so <laughs> I can just say that there was never any discussion between this other party, my girlfriend and myself. We went out to, we went out clubbing. We did a bunch of Coke. We came back to the house. I'm fucking this girl in bed and the other, and then all of a sudden I hear her sucking and I was like, huh, well, I'll be goddamned. And that's just how it started. Like, but like cocaine's a hell of a drug and you know, uh, you, so you, things are going to happen. <laughs> Um, any thoughts on the 1980 Mr. Olympia? I think we'll do a whole episode on that eventually. We've kind of touched on it here and there. Um, I'm going to make a video about it eventually that kind of delves into a little bit more about it. But uh, any quick kind of thoughts? Do you think Arnold should have won? Uh, it should have been anyone in the uh, under 200 class. There, there shouldn't have been. It wasn't even a discussion. They should have just told the heavyweights to get the fuck off the stage. Go home. Like you're an embarrassment. Like Dennis Tenorino and your weird legs. Like, just get the fuck on out of here. We don't need to see that shit. Like that. I mean, was Tony Pearson in that? He could stay, but everybody else needs to get the fuck off the stage. Yeah, no, he wasn't. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, the biggest victim of this was Vince Garanda. I Vince Garanda was a fucking dickhead. Uh, I I don't think he was a victim of anything. I think if anything, he dodged a lot of beatings he should have caught. Like, uh, <laughs> I, he he really. I hate Vince Garanda. Can you imagine being in a gym and some, is somebody telling you not to talk? Go fuck yourself, old man. Come over here and fucking make me. Like, especially in the, in the years of like, they're taking methyl test, methyl test and amphetamines and some old man's going to talk wild at you. Come on and fucking get these hands, old man. Uh, yeah, apparently uh, Joe Gold, Louis was uh, training. Uh, both of our shirts are death related, yes. <laughs> <laughs> you know how Louis is is deaf and he makes this, noise. He probably doesn't even hear himself. I want to make my own version of this. Can you read the back? Uh, you're a little bit off off camera oh. there. Oh, okay. It says, "My heart beats to destroy your dreams." <laughs> I used to wear this uh, to every meet. So Louis was training in Gold's gym, like you know, sorry, World's gym, which was owned by Joel, Joe Gold. And because Louis's deaf, he makes lots of noise. So Joe Gold came over to Louis and said. Uh, shut the fuck up, you you fat fuck, or something, and yeah. threw Louis <laughs> out of the gym. <laughs> uh, speaking of Louis, he nearly well, he didn't go to jail, but I found like a, a funny story about him that I've never heard before. He was getting a a ticket for his truck that was illegally parked, and so he came out fucking screaming at the person writing the ticket, who's a female, and she was in like a little uh, I don't know cart or something, and he punched the windscreen of the singer and smashed it. And, um, you know, he got, you know, busted by the police. Obviously, didn't get to go to jail. But Von Moger was, style. You broke my rinser, my boy, my boomerang. <laughs> but I just sort of thought, you know, it goes to show as well how, you know, greedy that prick was. Just for getting written up for a, uh, for a parking ticket, he's got to hulk out and smash a windscreen. Well done, Louie. Those guys were such dickheads. And then, like, Ken Sprague is such a nice guy. So it's like, how the, he must have just been like, what the fuck am I doing surrounded by these dickheads? It's no why wonder he, so he just Ken. became like a porn mogul because, like, why would he want to even be around a bodybuilder? That's why, like, when people are like, oh, why don't you train at a hardcore gym? Because those people are fucking posers and they're annoying as shit. Yeah, so Vince Dronda was extremely against music, Jake's channel says, but he um, Vince was also a a raging alcoholic apparently and that wasn't really well known for all the health um, guru advice the guy used to spout he was uh off his tits on alcohol half the time so kind of makes sense contradiction <laughs> whereas at golds they were just blazed all day long like zabo was the guy who i feel like got robbed for being too lean and zabo there was never a moment where zabo was not high there's, I think the best picture I've ever seen of Zabo. He's pulling down his glasses and staring all big eyed at this lady's tits, like two inches away from him. And he's just going, it's a great picture. And, uh, but he was just blazed in like a fucking goofball. And he's the guy who ran gold. So like he and Tommy, Ch he was the guy who hired Tommy Chong. And like, just the fact that Tommy Chong worked at Gold's and then everybody over at Garanda's like, man, don't play music, man. <laughs> we're gonna be the we're gonna be the most unpleasant people around, man. Frank Zane, get in here, man. <laughs> uh Jamie, it's always Menster a pleasure. didn't train there. <laughs> like just it's get every dickhead from Gold's, like, go train over there. Like, get the fuck on out of here. <laughs> 
It's always a pleasure to have you on, mate, each week. Uh, it's a breath of fresh air, and I always learn a ton, as do the viewers. Uh, people request me each week in my DM saying, when's Jamie on next? What are you guys going to be talking about? Oh, that's awesome. Uh, I love this? doing these. These are fun as hell, man. Yeah, did Ken Waller fit in with the bat with that crowd? Ken Waller was a ba a badass. He he loved to fucking bite that guy and throw down. You know, Ken with Waller's one of those blank spots in my knowledge. I don't know much about him. I really like uh he was such a like I didn't really like him in pumping iron, and I think that's why I just was like, yeah, fuck him. I don't know. Uh yeah, no, he was he's a good guy. And um Is he? Yeah, yeah. We should try and have him on the show sometime. I'm not sure if he's doing interviews anymore because yeah. His last one kind of he got kind of got fucked over a little bit. Oh I shit! What who. But um, yeah. You don't want to say by who? Positive. Sorry. You don't want to uh, say by who? Yeah. You want to give us some hints? <laughs> what right. does it rhyme with? Uh, it, it's yeah, it's complicated. Oh my god, anyway. you're a you're you're a fucking pussy. Uh, Jake, thank you, <laughs> thank you for asking questions and for not being a pussy. CS, I will do an episode shirtless this summer. Uh, or probably all of them. Uh, and uh, that time was so much better than depressing, lonely, modern, modern. But yeah, like, Levron was fucking cool, though. Like, Levron, he got bigger for shows, like like people used to do back in the day. Like, Arnold know those guys trained up for the show. So you'd end up 20 or 30 pounds. You know everybody's saying now, like, you can't get lean and grow muscle? Well, everybody back in the day did. Like, Chuck Sipes, for instance, would be a 185-pound mountain man, and then he would show up, 220 pounds and fucking uh, like at every meet because he would just for like the 12 weeks or whatever, he would stuff himself with food and train like crazy. Um, but, Jamie, like that's so understated and a real excellent point that a lot of people just seem to fucking miss these days. That's exactly what they all did. They would train up for the show and diet and gain muscle at the same time. And these yep. days everyone's like, oh, you fucking can't do that. Yeah, but they uh, people will they knife fight you about it. They would bet their whole bank account. And it's like literally all of human history is against you on this, but they just they're insistent. And you know what? The nice thing about the uh, placebo effect is you make that happen by believing it. So you will not grow. And because you told yourself you couldn't. Exactly. I couldn't agree more. I want to thank you again for coming on today, mate. You always make my day or my evening. No, thank you for having me on. I appreciate and, it. I uh, can't wait to do it again. Go over and fucking buy Jamie's books. It's not a request. It's an order. He's got huge <laughs> natty arms. Um, somebody was asking in the comments before, when's the physical books coming out? Probably not for a while, I'm guessing. You know, uh, no, my, my wife's still working on that. It's only a 60-page book. So I actually kept that one short enough that you could just print it out if you wanted to. So uh, it, it might be easier for you to do it that way. <laughs> it would be way cheaper. I can tell you that. Yeah. So head over, support Jamie, get his books. And um, yeah, thanks again, man. Always appreciate it. Yeah. And oh, yo, uh, I have a podcast called Prize Fighters, Circus Freaks and Gangsters. It's on Spotify, iTunes, everywhere. Uh, we I use it because I'm trying to give you guys the context so you can understand why people did the things they did back in the day. So you understand what Hackenschmidt was living like what you, rather than just like why he was doing that stupid fucking squat. You'll know what he was eating, what he was training like, what he was sleeping like, what his clothes were like. Shit like that matters. And it explains why certain things happened the way they did. So check that shit out. It's prize fighters, circus freaks, gangsters. It's on everything. My co-host Greta is a former science teacher turned food historian. We cover everything that you could possibly be interested in. And we use movies and TV shows to do the teaching. So it's a lot of fun. Yeah. We're doing Shogun right now, which isn't 19th century, but is fun. <laughs> Have you, have you released the episodes of Shogun yet? Because I'm really looking forward to that one. Yeah, yeah. Uh, episode one's already out. Excellent. I'm going to check it out. But yeah, Sweet. you guys really do go deep. And it's uh, such an intellectual, but also a very fun podcast. So make sure you check that out as well, guys. All right. Thanks, for coming thanks on, guys. Man. Yo, you guys are awesome. Thanks for having me on, dude. Yeah, thanks everybody for your questions and comments. We really love it and appreciate it as well. See you next week. See you guys.